Hello there and a very good evening. You're watching Primetime News on TV1. For the News First Team, I'm Dasani Athalda. Let's start off with a look at tonight's headlines. Social media are on fire over the controversial decision made by the umpires at the ICC Cricket World Cup final. President says an election that will create a new government will be held in five months. Garbage laden containers to be opened publicly on Thursday. Police present facts to court regarding the Blue Mountain fraud. A director further remanded. Investigations underway in search of major suspects. Back in local news, the new district hospital constructed in Noralia was declared open by President Maitri Pala Sirisena today. The hospital was constructed at a cost of 7 billion rupees, provided as aid from the Netherlands. The hospital is equipped with wards containing a total of 600 beds, state-of-the-art surgery rooms, an intensive care unit and an outpatient department. After declaring open the new hospital, the president also took an inspection tour of the premises. The president also checked in the first three patients at the hospital. Thirteen linear accelerators. I won't say which member of the family was involved in this. Thirteen of these were given to treat cancer patients. They signed off on an agreement for a massive cost, but it was all old equipment from Europe. Sri Lankans in Canada contacted me and they said that this is about four to five million US dollars more expensive. Would you like to get the price reduced? I said, why would I not agree? How much of other equipment could I purchase for that price in Sri Lanka? There was a person called the project manager. He was not a qualified person. When we looked into who he was, he was a former office assistant who was appointed to that position. When I took over the ministry, three of these linear accelerators had been brought down to the country. A specialist doctor should sign off on it. A man named Vasanth Jayawardhana had signed for these equipment. We tried to find that person, but there wasn't a doctor by that name. We got his telephone number from the foreigners. We called that number and found out that it was only the person in the next room. He does not have any medical qualifications. If this government did not come into power, you would have got the substandard equipment sent from those countries. They are the patriots and we are the traitors. After becoming president in 2015, in the three years that followed, 2015, 2016 and 2017, they came after me seeking permission to purchase linear accelerators under the same tender of the Ministry of Health for the medical faculty under the Kotalavala Defence University. If there was another person as the Minister of Defence who did not know anything about this, he would have given permission to make the purchase under the same tender. I said that I know the story behind this and there is a person who should be held responsible for this tender at the KDU as well. So I will not allow for a linear accelerator for the KDU under the same tender. This is how corruption has enveloped the country. The president also spoke on the upcoming elections and the decisions that should be made by the people. We changed a government like that and established a new government to rid the country of this corruption. But you and I both know that we were not able to do that. So the people in the country say that both of these governments are thieves. The people of this country will be given the opportunity to form a new government within five months. The people of the country will receive the power to vote in a clean government with clean politicians without appointing a government full of thieves. That is a decision that should be taken by the people. Drugs are something that can easily destroy a country. That is why the drug dealers in the country are destroying the universities in the country by providing drugs for free. That is why they are destroying school children, including A-level students, by providing drugs for free. There is a question as to how many people in the country can work with an honest intention. The people who act in a manner disregarding good state administration and do not love the general public and the nation are the ones who are responsible for all of it. <laughs> Opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksa attended a religious program in Mavitra Piliandala today. 
The opposition leader paid homage to the relics recovered during excavations of the Nilagiri Saya that are currently placed at the Mavitra Siriti Sarana Dhamma Institution in Piliandala. Mahindra Rajapaksa later responded to certain questions raised by the media. There is talk of the death penalty now. I think that the death penalty that was carried out in the 70s during the time of Sirimavu Bandaranaika, the president now thinks that it should be implemented again. He thinks that he can curb the drug menace through it. That is what he thinks. Everyone in the country believes that this is not necessary. There should be punishments. Those should not be withdrawn. The death penalty should not be withdrawn as a punishment, but it should not be implemented. That is my personal belief. No, I was in Colombo. No, I did not meet him. He went there. I had asked him for electricity to be provided to the Kondagala Viharaya. He had looked into it and provided them with power. No, I did not. I was here. Even you met me yesterday. <laughs> Prime Minister Arnold Vikrama Singh had toured Jaffna today. The 125th anniversary celebration of the Jaffna Skandavarodeya School was presided over by Prime Minister Ranil Vikrama Singh. We came in the hope of finding a political solution. We discussed one, but unfortunately we didn't have a majority in parliament. No one had a majority in parliament. So it dragged. But I like to say that I and my party stands committed to devolution and we will discuss it and implement a devolution which gives the type of powers you want which is acceptable to the Muslims, to the Muslims and others a devolution based on it. Although it was stated that the Prime Minister does not have a majority in Parliament, the motion of no confidence presented against the government on the 4th of April 2018 was defeated by 42 votes. Subsequently, when Mahindra Rajapaksa was appointed as the Prime Minister on the 26th of October, the two motions of no confidence brought against his government were also decided in favour of Ranil Vikramasinghe. The motion of no confidence brought against the government on the 11th of this month by the JVP was also won by Ranil Vikramasinghe by 27 votes. Why is it that the government's majority in Parliament that comes into play when their power is at risk? not present when it comes to solving the issues of the general public. Should it be reminded that the general public are intelligent enough to reject statements of this nature? The leader of the National Freedom Front, Vimal Viravansa, expressed these views while addressing a meeting in Mulativ yesterday. Five million rupees per parliamentarian of the Tamil National Alliance. They are being given bribes. Why are they supporting Ranil Vikramasinghe's government? If they don't support the government, they will not be given the official residence of the opposition leader. If something like this was given to Mahindra Rajpaksa, how will the Red Elephant Calf speak of it? Recently, the Red Elephant Calf brought forward a motion of no confidence and lost it. From the time he lost the motion, he started scolding Mahindra Rajpaksa and our camp. <laughs> At least Sambandan says that he is working closely with the JVP, but the JVP did not ask us to vote in favour of this motion of no confidence. Why didn't he ask his friend Sambandan to support this? Why didn't he ask his friend Sumandiran? These people who are not bringing in motions of no confidence to overthrow the government of Ranim Vikramasinghe, they are bringing these motions to show that Ranim Vikramasinghe has the majority in parliament. Now this is the problem that Ranim Vikramasinghe has. Sajid Premadasa says that if he becomes a presidential candidate, he needs the position of party leader as well. Rani Vikramasinghe is assessing the situation to field himself as a candidate if the solution is favourable. If that is not possible, he will hold on to the position of party leader and give the presidential candidacy to someone like Karujai Surya. Karu will not ask for party leadership. Karu will contest and he will lose. When Karu loses, he will have to go home and Rani Vikramasinghe will stand to be the opposition leader. He is not a person that can be chased away like that. That is the plan of Ranil Vikramasinghe.
following is a revelation made by UPFA MP Susil Premajayanta at a meeting held in Venapur. Four years ago today, six acres of DCC was taken over by the Ministry of Justice to build a house of justice consisting 42 courts and with full facilities. The plans have been drawn and the estimation of that project has been done already. It will take three and a half to four years to complete this project and the total cost stands at 18 billion rupees. Now what happened to this? Pascal Lingam, who is from the Economic Committee led by the Prime Minister, brought down an investor to invest in this. Now the court complex is going to be built using investment. 100 million dollars. This is going to be given away according to the BOT method. Then, after this is completed, according to this method, we had to pay 200 million every month for the next 20 years. Looking at the calculations, only 18 million will be the cost for the completion of this project, but we have to pay 45 million. This is the plan presented by this government to build this court complex. I asked the Minister of Justice as to why this is being done when I met her in Parliament. If you allocate 4 billion rupees a year, this project can be completed in 4 to 5 years. It is very clear. One thing is that they are not aware of this project. The other thing is, there is always an intention of seeking a commission from all of this. Otherwise, why would the construction of a court complex be given to an investor? Deputy Leader of the United National Party, Minister Sajid Premadasa, expressed these views at an event in Veerakatiya today. It is by heeding to the wishes of the people, understanding their aspirations and fulfilling them that the democratic process is carried out. My friends, I would like to tell you on this occasion that different people are expressing different opinions. People are thinking of themselves and saying various things and playing political games. I promise all of them, you and the people of this country, that this time I will not allow them to play games. I would like to say that this time we will empower the wishes of the people. <laughs> The minister also handed out benefits to residents of Veerakatiya who attended the event which was part of the Samita 7 and Nivasa Mobile Services Unit. While a number of activities including the handing over of home loans took place, the total value of the initiative was approximately 38 million rupees. According to the customs, the containers containing garbage, which are in the custody of customs officials, will be opened on Thursday. Customs confirmed that the initial investigations into the incident have concluded. 94 of the 102 containers sent to Sri Lanka from the United Kingdom were found to be full of garbage after custom officials opened and inspected five of them. Against the backdrop where there are strict laws on garbage disposal in developed nations, the procedure is highly expensive. Former additional secretary to the Ministry of Environment, Professor Padmini Batuitage, said that the developed countries tactically use developing countries like Sri Lanka to dump their waste. The Basel Convention is an international convention with 187 signatory countries. Sri Lanka ratified the convention in 1992. If any form of waste is to be exported to another country, the permission of that country must be sought first. In Sri Lanka, the competent authority for this is the Central Environmental Authority. At that time itself, we took a cabinet decision and got cabinet approval for that as well, not to import any waste material from any other country in the world. The Technical Committee also decided that if if any such waste is to be brought into the country for the purpose of processing, the resulting waste after the processing should be sent back to the country that it was initially imported from. We were careful not to allow garbage brought in from another country to end up being an issue for our country. However, the company that imported these consignments of garbage had relied on this extraordinary gasset notification issued on the 11th of July 2013 and brought down the containers on false pretenses. According to the law of the country, will the garbage be sent back? The people are watching. The following report is a revelation which should be brought to the attention of the groups that are involved in agreements such as the SOFA, the government and the general public. While Sri Lanka debates the pros and cons of the SOFA agreement, many countries that signed the agreement are now beginning to experience the detrimental effects of the pact with the US. Here is one such example. 
Foreign media reported that an Australian woman who was raped by a U.S. military serviceman more than a decade ago has renewed her request to Japan's government to amend the Japan-U.S. Status of Forces Agreement, which critiques claim allows both countries to evade responsibility for misconduct linked to U.S. bases. Court records show that Fisher was raped by American serviceman Bloke Deans near the U.S. Navy base in Yokosuka, Kanagawa Prefecture in 2002. In 2004, a Tokyo court ordered Deans to pay 3 million yen in damages as compensation. But he had already left Japan and has not returned. Fisher later asked the foreign ministry to locate him, but she said her request was rejected based on Article 16 of the SOFA agreement. Mr. Vice President, for over 70 years, U.S. military servicemen have committed crime in Japan. 1952 to 2017, over 210,000 crimes accidents, so on. These are according to the Ministry of Defense. Are these mere numbers? I was one of those numbers. I was raped. Japan police held me for 13 hours. No food, no water, treated like a criminal, forced to look for the rapist, reenact the rape in photos. I am the first woman to break the silence in Japan after being raped in 2002. For this, I am followed by secret police, received death threats. I won my case in Tokyo, but the rapist fled Japan. I looked for him for 10 years by myself. I found him. No woman should have to fight this hard for justice. I sued the rapist in the USA, and I won again. And the US courts endorsed the Japanese verdict. I was entitled to receive compensation. I asked for one dollar, because justice is not about money to me. I want rape to stop. 18 years now, I tried to change the SOFA agreement that let the rapist flee Japan. 2016, Okinawa woman murdered, stuffed into a suitcase. In the past, six-year-old girl raped, mutilated, women beaten to death in the street. This is happening in Japan now. I speak on behalf of all victims. I request the UN to investigate these violations of human rights. Impunity of U.S. military crimes must stop. Thank you for hearing my voice, our voices, Vice President. Fisher said she was told by the ministry at the time that members of the U.S. military only have to quote-unquote respect the laws of Japan, not obey them, unquote. She believes the word respect in the article should have been interpreted to mean almost the same as obey when the pact came into force in 1960. Deans was never subject to a criminal prosecution. In an effort to secure justice, Fisher agreed to a $1 settlement in exchange for an admission from Deans that he committed the rape. The European Union and Sri Lanka held an informal counter-terrorism dialogue underlining the EU's solidarity with Sri Lanka following the April 21st terror attack. The meeting was chaired by EU counterterrorism coordinator Giles D. Kachov, accompanied by EEAS head of division for counterterrorism John Gart Rutter, and on the Sri Lankan side by acting secretary of foreign affairs Ahmad A. Jawad. Common challenges relating to violent extremism and terrorism were discussed and experience regarding responses were shared. In a media release, the EU says it underlined the importance of efficient coordinating of counterterrorism efforts, the essence of focusing on the prevention of violent extremism, and the importance of counterterrorism responses to be fully in line with human rights obligations. The EU presented a support package for Sri Lanka under the instrument contributing to stability and peace to be implemented with the UN ODC and UNDP. The package worth 8.5 million euros will notably focus on law enforcement, rehabilitation and disengagement, counter-narratives and online radicalization. Rather, a lot is desired from the arrival of the EU delegation at this particular juncture in time. The European Union proposes to assist us in counter-terrorism. Sri Lanka has 33 plus years of expertise in handling terrorism and it would be fair to say that Sri Lanka's forces, both military and intelligence, have an enviable record in this respect. The recent detection of several container loads laden with garbage originating from the EU, including possibly highly toxic clinical waste, in clear contravention of the rules operating in this country, is a matter of grave concern to the people. The EU authorities who wish to share their intelligent expertise in Sri Lanka may well be better advised to deploy their knowledge and stop the export of illegal cargo to Sri Lanka. 
As for the various financial offerings made during the period in which Sri Lanka will have a potential three elections is also highly suspect. If the EU wishes to be generous to the people of this country, there are scores of poverty alleviation projects in rural areas that begs to be funded. Our Prime Minister's statement that 98% of terrorism has been eradicated is a significant departure from a time in this country when the country enjoyed a 100% terror-free status. Haphazard handling of intelligence data and a blasé attitude towards security has sadly impacted on the country and its economy. The people of Sri Lanka view with grave concern the arrival of Trojan horses at a crucial crossroads of this country's political landscape. On to another headline-making story. A case filed by a customer of the Blue Mountain Property Company was taken up before the Kasbaba Magistrate today. The case was heard by Acting Magistrate PWSH Veera Singha. The case has been filed over how the Blue Mountain Real Estate Company had defrauded a customer by not providing a deed even after a complete payment was made. As such, the case was filed against officials of Blue Mountain over charges including fraud, criminal misconduct and breach of trust. Maharu Ferosh Hetiarachi, a director of Blue Mountain who was arrested in connection to the incident, was also produced in court today. At the hearing, the Mount Lavinia Special Fraud Investigation Division informed court that other directors and senior officials were not found at their houses or at their place of work. As a result, four individuals, including Blue Mountain Managing Director Saumya Hittiarachi, are due to be arrested. Today there were police officers from Kulia Pitya who came to court stating that this individual is a wanted suspect named in a case that is being heard in Kulia Pitya as well. While the case will be taken up again on the 29th of July, the acting magistrate ordered for the suspect in custody to be remanded until that date. Today is a special day for the devotees who took part in the Padayatra as they approach the Kataragama Devalaya. This is a yatra to pay reverence to the gods. It is a journey to pay our respects. We are now at a turning point on this journey. From here, we will travel to the Yala Katagamu entrance, from where they will then head towards Katragama. They have come a long way from the Okanda Devale to head back towards civilization. So our journey will also move ahead with theirs. Even though we chose Varahana as the place to spend our last night here, it is normal for many to spend a few more nights here. The distance between the Varahana and the Katagamu entrance in Yala is 8 kilometers. The devotees who entered the Kumana Reserve from Okanda will leave the reserve in Katagamu. It is the duty of the army to record the number of devotees who leave the reserve. Even though they rest on the way to Kataragama Mahadevalaya, yet another place of interest for many is the Ganapati Shrine at the Satya Shri Forest in Kochipotana. The Belimal drink handed over to the people at this shrine for Lord Ganesh is one that is raved about. The journey from here to the Kataragama Devalaya is one that lies through the Kataragama town. The Padayatra ends with the puja carried out for the Prince Kanda but devotees remain in Kataragama all the way up until the Diyakapi Memangalaya and the final Perhara. The end of this procession is signalled by the puja held for Prince Kanda here in Kataragama. Their belief in God far outweighs the effort taken to engage in the Padayatra. It is this belief over their physical strength that carries them forward. Activist and former senior banker Rusri Pala Thennakon spoke about the Millennium Challenge Cooperation Compact and U.S. agreements on the Newsline program aired this morning. 95 through yeah. that this country signed a SOFA agreement. In 1996, this country, the parliament, passed an act, Diplomatic Privileges Act number The Diplomatic nine. Privileges Act, Act. Yeah. Now, in 1996, 
what made them pass that act? We are unable to extend jurisdiction powers to anybody other than the diplomatic mission persons because of an act that has been passed in parliament and which is in force in the country. And that's a wrap of primetime news for tonight. For the News First team, I'm Dasani Adhada. Good night.